making love to you is all I want to do. Wayne Newton, the man with the golden voice, has captivated audiences with his famous performances for decades. His life story is a fascinating journey of talent, tenacity, and accomplishment, from humble origins to becoming a Las Vegas icon. But behind the dazzling curtain is a chest of struggles and tribulations that have tested his mettle, demonstrating that even the brightest stars must weather their storms. Join us as we take you through the highs and lows of the legendary life of Wayne Newton. Number 9. Early Years Wayne Newton, born Carson Wayne Newton, was the son of car mechanic Patrick Newton and his wife Evelyn Marie Smith. His ancestors are English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh, and German. Although according to some rumors, he also has Native American roots. However, this is not officially recognized by any tribe. Wayne's father, Patrick, served in the United States Navy during the Second World War, which had a huge impact on Wayne's early years. Wayne Newton grew up in Fredericksburg, Virginia, where he began his musical career at a young age. He demonstrated exceptional musical skill at the early age of six, learning to play the piano, guitar, and acoustic guitar. Even before starting school, his early love of music prompted him to perform on a local music radio show, where he played the acoustic guitar and sang country songs. He happily engaged in a traveling road show linked with the Grand Ole Opry on weekends. Wayne's family moved to the Newark, Ohio area when he was a child. There, he began singing at local bars, theaters, and fairs, frequently with his older brother, Jerry. Wayne's life was turned upside down due to his severe asthma, which prompted his family to relocate to Phoenix in 1952 on the advice of his doctor. Shortly after landing in Phoenix, the Newton brothers competed in and won a local television talent program called the Lou King Rangers. This success piqued the interest of Tom Chauncey, the owner of Cool TV, which also aired the talent contest. Tom Chauncey not only recognized their talent, but also played an important mentoring role for them. The Newton brothers were eventually given their own television show, Rascals in Rhythm. They used this opportunity to showcase their musical abilities, enthralling listeners and laying the groundwork for a bright future. Wayne and his brother had the honor of performing on Grand Ole Opry Roadshows and on ABC TV's Ozark Jubilee as the Rascals in Rhythm. Notably, they had the privilege of performing in front of Dwight Eisenhower, the then President of the United States. Wayne Newton's educational path began at North High School, where he actively participated in leadership roles. He was the sophomore class president and a member of the Reserve Officers Training Corps, which trains commissioned officers for the United States Armed Forces. In the spring of 1958, during his junior year of high school, a Las Vegas booking agent saw the Newton brothers' spellbinding performance on their local TV show and invited them to audition. The agent was so impressed with Wayne Newton and his brother's talent that he signed them to a two-week contract to play at the Flamingo in Las Vegas. The two brothers' brilliance was evident, and they received an attractive offer on the last night of their engagement, a one-year contract to continue playing in Las Vegas. Wayne Newton made the difficult decision to leave North High School just before the end of his junior year to pursue his developing music career. Wayne Newton, then 18, applied to join the United States military, but his asthma problem resulted in a one-year rejection, which meant he could only serve in a major emergency. Undaunted, he poured his musical love into playing for troops overseas, devoting his time to entertain and elevate those who were serving their country. Number 8. Struggle to Success Wayne Newton's early success in Las Vegas was not just due to his extraordinary talent, but also to his amazing ability to connect with his audience on a deep level. He had an inherent feel of what the audience wanted to hear, and this emotional connection was crucial in propelling his career. Wayne Newton, a young and burgeoning star, played the beautiful Irish folk tune Danny Boy for none other than the legendary Jackie Gleason in Phoenix in 1962. Newton's performance wowed Gleason, who was known for his refined taste and critical eye. He saw something special in the young artist and made a meaningful declaration to him, stating, Don't go on any other television show before you go on mine. This was a testimonial to Newton's great talent and charisma. The Newton brothers made their first appearance on The Jackie Gleason Show on September 29, 1962. 
They had no idea that this was just the start of a big chapter in Wayne's career. Newton would appear on Gleason's show 12 times over the next two years, marking his first appearance on national television. It was here that he began to win the hearts of viewers all throughout the country. Wayne Newton was a phenomenal vocalist, but he was an equally amazing actor from the early to mid-1960s. In the famous Western TV series Bonanza, he played Andy, the baby-faced Ponderosa ranch hand. Newton first met another music and entertainment star, Elvis Presley, who happened to be working on a different show on the same set while Newton was filming Bonanza. The event created the groundwork for the two icons' profound and long-lasting friendship. Wayne Newton's career took a significant turn in 1962 when Jackie Gleason negotiated a critical engagement between him and the legendary Copacabana. Newton had the pleasure of meeting Bobby Darin, another entertainment business veteran during his time at Copacabana. Darren was not only awestruck by Newton's talent, but he also sensed enormous potential in him. As a result, Darren decided to produce Newton's records, a choice that would impact his musical career dramatically. Wayne Newton had signed with Capitol Records by 1963, marking a watershed event in his musical career. His debut record, issued on the Capitol Records label, provided him with fresh opportunities in the music industry. One of his most well-known singles, Danke Schoen, which became an iconic part of his repertoire, was initially written for Bobby Darin to perform. Darren, on the other hand, saw Newton's talent and gladly offered him the tune. Danke Schoen went on to reach the 13th position on the Hot 100 list, cementing Wayne Newton's standing in the music industry. Number 7. From Opening Act to Headliner As Wayne Newton's reputation rose, he gained the support and affection of various entertainment figures. Legends such as Lucille Ball, Danny Thomas, George Burns, and Jack Benny recognized his extraordinary potential and welcomed him into their society. For example, Jack Benny was impressed by Newton's performance at a nightclub in Sydney, Australia, and later invited him to open for one of his concerts at Harrah's Reno. Benny was so taken by Wayne Newton that he hired him not only as an opening act for his comedy show in Las Vegas, but also as a regular on the Jack Benny program for five years. Newton was offered the opportunity to open for another comedian at the Flamingo in Las Vegas after completing his commitment to Benny's program. However, he had higher ambitions and voiced a wish to be a headline act, which was granted in 1963. This change was a key step in his career, consolidating his position as a starring act in the world's entertainment capital. Newton's versatility as an entertainer shined apparent when he appeared on The Lucy Show in 1965. His portrayal of a farm lad serenading animals made an indelible impression on the audience. The network saw his potential and offered him his own TV show centered on this persona. Newton, however, declined the offer in a moment of extraordinary insight and foresight. This decision was made on the advice of none other than Lucille Ball, who understood that playing a country lad would confine him for the rest of his career. It was a decision that demonstrated Wayne Newton's devotion to his craft as well as his desire to grow and evolve as a performer. Wayne Newton was known for his distinctive high-pitched voice throughout his career, which remained with him for the bulk of his musical career. Despite significant alterations in his vocal range in the 1970s and 1980s, his distinct timbre persisted in distinguishing him as a one-of-a-kind singer. Wayne Newton's career focus shifted dramatically during the 1970s. He began to focus largely on performing in Las Vegas, the world's entertainment hub. This critical phase in his path occurred when he immersed himself in the colorful and ever-changing world of Las Vegas entertainment, where his name would become synonymous with a bright and enduring legacy. Number 6. Mr. Las Vegas It was the age following Elvis's departure from the world, and the Rat Pack was elegantly aging. Wayne Newton had reached the zenith of Las Vegas celebrity at that point. Consider the 1970s when Las Vegas was the center of entertainment and Wayne Newton was the unequaled star. His performances were legendary and he performed at places such as the Desert Inn, the Frontier, and the Sands Hotel and Casino. Those who saw his gigs knew they were witnessing something special as Newton held the record for total crowd counts throughout his heyday, an incredible monument to his magnetic stage presence. When it came to Wayne Newton, Esquire, the judge of style and taste, didn't mince words. They dubbed him 
the biggest moneymaker in the history of Las Vegas. That's right, not even Elvis or Frank Sinatra had bagged this honor. Newton's ability to lure audiences week after week was unparalleled. His presentations, in and of themselves, were legendary for their length. They stood out in stark contrast to the shorter acts that were prevalent in Las Vegas at the time, often lasting up to three hours. Newton struck gold, not just metaphorically but physically, in 1972. His rendition of Daddy Don't You Walk So Fast became a smash hit, selling over a million copies. That same year, the song peaked at number four in the United States and reached number one in both Australia and Canada. The album of the same name was equally successful, landing at number 25 on the album charts. However, Newton's fame expanded beyond the borders of the United States. In 1975, he collaborated with Glenn Campbell on a BBC television special titled Glenn Campbell Live in London. Wayne Newton made headlines for reasons other than his music. Independence Day performances on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., featuring the Beach Boys and the Grass Roots, drew large crowds in the early 1980s. However, things took an unexpected turn in 1983. President Ronald Reagan's Secretary of the Interior, James G. Watt, prohibited such concerts on the mall, citing worries about drug use, drinking, and the inappropriate audience. Newton was chosen to perform in the 1983 Independence Day celebration on the mall, demonstrating his close friendship with the president. The audience applauded and jeered as he took the stage, demonstrating the intricacies of the moment. Another watershed moment in Wayne Newton's spectacular career occurred in the late 1980s. On May 23, 1989, a live stage performance was presented as a pay-per-view event named Wayne Newton Live in Concert. In an unexpected turn, Newton did not perform Danke Schoen or Red Roses for a Blue Lady. Instead, he finished the evening with a special rendition of MacArthur Park, which culminated in on-stage rain, leaving the audience drenched in both song and amazement. Wayne Newton's star shone brightly as the 1990s progressed. He expanded beyond his initial Las Vegas strongholds to become the main attraction at other prominent casinos, such as Bally's, Caesars Palace, and MGM Grand Las Vegas. In 1994, he accomplished an incredible feat by doing his 25,000th solo act in Las Vegas. Newton signed a two-year contract with the Stardust in 1999, marking a watershed event in his career. He was supposed to play at the Stardust for 40 weeks out of the year, six concerts a week, in a showroom named after him. This headliner-in-residence arrangement was a first of its type, demonstrating Wayne Newton's ongoing appeal in the entertainment capital. This spectacular chapter ended amicably in 2000, as the Stardust Casino faced demolition. Wayne Newton's final performance at the Stardust on April 20, 2005, was nothing short of spectacular. He sang virtually his entire repertoire, paying respect not only to his own career, but also to the legendary Vegas entertainers who had left an everlasting stamp on the city. Before we move along, let's take a look at today's subscriber pick. This up-close photo of Wayne Newton is proof that despite being 81 years old, he's still a young lad at heart. Just like all the other divas of Hollywood, Wayne has done his best to maintain his looks. It's quite evident from his face that the all-rounder superstar has been under the knife to appear younger. From the thousands of photos comparing his looks before and after getting plastic surgery, it seems that he has gotten Botox to erase the telltale signs of time, skillfully eliminating wrinkles and restoring a youthful appearance. According to some experts have suggested that Wayne underwent a comprehensive facelift alongside a brow lift in order to enhance the brow's position and smoothen the forehead, creating a revitalized look. While Wayne Newton's plastic surgery ventures have sparked debate, they definitely represent his desire to project a lively and young image on the vast stage of entertainment. As he continues to amaze audiences with his ageless abilities, his path exemplifies the ever-changing world of cosmetic improvements and the influence they have on individuals wanting to embrace their best selves. Would you guys consider undergoing cosmetic procedures to look young and attractive even when you're old? Let us know in the comments below. Number 5. Legal Troubles Newton's life's narrative is an intricate blend of accomplishments and tribulations a roller coaster trip that resonates with the human spirit, from the dazzling stages of Las Vegas to the courtroom hallways. 
Newton found himself in a high-stakes arrangement as part owner of the Aladdin Hotel in the early 1980s. However, what was intended to be a winning hand quickly devolved into a legal war royale. Lawsuits piled up, and the magnificent project devolved into a maze of legal proceedings. The cards did not fall in his favor, and he was unable to purchase the full hotel in 1983. It was a tumultuous period in the life of the guy who once commanded the Las Vegas Strip. In 1992, the showbiz master found himself writing a different tune, one of financial struggle. Newton filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in order to reorganize a staggering $20 million in obligations. A substantial percentage of this debt was accumulated during Newton's protracted court struggle with NBC, in which Newton accused the network of libel for alleging that he had partnered with the Mafia in the Aladdin purchase. The bankruptcy filing was more than simply a financial setback, a pointer to the serious problems he was facing. But like a phoenix rising from the ashes, Wayne Newton was able to regain financial stability by 1999. The financial roller coaster, however, was not over with him. The IRS arrived in August 2005, claiming that he and his wife owed more than $1.8 million in taxes and penalties. A strange twist emerged when one of Newton's tax attorneys challenged this assertion, claiming, we believe the IRS owes him money. The situation resembled a financial seesaw with every dollar in question. Later that year, in 2009, Oakland County International Airport in Waterford, Michigan, made an astonishing assertion. They claimed Newton owed them more than $60,000 in unpaid parking fines. What's the reason? More than three years prior, Newton had abandoned a $2 million Fokker 28 jet at the airfield. This plane was flown in for refurbishment in 2005. And after the work was finished in 2007, it was moved to an outdoor parking location, where the monthly parking rates were a whopping $5,000. To maintain its airworthiness, an aircraft of this caliber must operate its engines at least once a month, as aviation enthusiasts are aware. The plane was eventually disassembled, relocated, and reassembled on Newton's estate grounds, bringing this remarkable chapter to a close. Another legal battle loomed in February 2010, this time involving Bruton Smith, who sued Newton, claiming delinquency on a loan personally guaranteed by the entertainer. Smith, who had obtained the loan from Bank of America, attempted to seize Newton's prized Las Vegas property, Casa de Shenandoah. Simultaneously, Clark County Sheriff's deputies attempted to serve civil papers and seize property in connection with Newton's $500,000 judgment against Monty Ward, his former personal pilot. Newton's security team, on the other hand, refused to accept the papers, thus complicating the legal situation. As if that weren't enough, Newton became embroiled in yet another dispute, this time over a blocked initiative to turn his 40-acre estate into a museum. A developer said that he paid $20 million for Newton's home with the expectation that Newton would quit the premises, allowing it to be converted into a museum. In a frightening twist, the developer claimed to have invested a stunning $50 million in the project. But Newton not only refused to leave, but also allegedly harassed construction workers. Newton's life would become much more complicated when the legal dispute went to trial in May 2013. The sale of Wayne Newton's estate, Casa de Shenandoah, which was placed for sale by Nathan & Associates, a Las Vegas brokerage firm, was then allowed by U.S. bankruptcy court judge Bruce Markell on December 17, 2012. The property was believed to be worth $50 million, but the narrative didn't end there. Newton negotiated an arrangement in 2015 with Lacey Harbor, a businesswoman who owned 70% of the firm that had purchased Casa de Shenandoah with the purpose of converting it into a museum. Newton and his family returned to the home, which opened for public tours in September 2015 after the establishment of a museum to house mementos. It was a monument to perseverance and a wonderful return to a place that carried so many memories for her. Wayne Newton's life had not been a straight path. It had been a winding, turning trip fraught with legal entanglements and financial changes. However, like a real showman, he tackled each difficulty head-on, demonstrating that when tried, the human spirit can rise and soar even higher. Number 4. Arabian Horse Breeding 
Wayne Newton's heart has always beaten to the rhythm of two interests that sparked his soul at a young age, music and horses. He once said, My two loves in life from the time I can remember were music and horses and I couldn't decide which I loved more. It was a delightful predicament, and he relished it heartily. His passion for horses extended to his Casa de Shenandoah property, where he reigned supreme with his Arabian horse breeding program, suitably dubbed Aramis Arabians. This equestrian sanctuary became the cradle of horse magic, spanning six generations and ushering in over 700 foals. An astonishing 96 champions emerged from among these majestic steeds, their bloodline standing evidence of Newton's commitment to the Arabian breed. Newton's passion for horses originated on his uncle's farm, which he visited frequently during his childhood. The seeds of this lifelong passion were planted there. He traded his bicycle and even his parents' movie camera for his first horse, a foal during sixth grade, demonstrating his dedication. He was initially drawn to thoroughbreds and American quarter horses, but his heart took a detour that would become a lifelong adventure when he fell head over hooves in love with the Arabian breed. This enchantment culminated in his acquisition of the champion stallion Aramis, a royal creature whose name would come to be associated with Newton's horse ranch. Their collaboration was a pivotal moment in the entertainer's equestrian career. Newton's name became well known among Arabian breeders in 1969 when he teamed up with Tom Chauncey, a well-known Arabian breeder and television station owner, to make a unique deal. They set their sights on Nabor, a stallion from Anne McCormick's farm, and at an incredible $150,000, it was a deal that stirred heads. In fact, it was the highest amount ever paid at auction for an Arabian horse, demonstrating their dedication to the breed. Newton, never one to rest on his laurels, continued to pursue his passion for Arabian horses. He soon formed another crucial alliance, this time with fellow Arabian breeders, to obtain Aramis, who happened to be a son of the legendary neighbor. Wayne Newton held sole possession of Aramis by 1972, marking the pinnacle of his horse odyssey. Newton received the Arabian Horse Breeders Alliance Lifetime Achievement Award in 2007 during the inaugural Arabian Breeders World Cup in Las Vegas in appreciation of his tremendous contributions to the world of Arabian horses. It was a touching moment that highlighted his lasting influence. Number 3. Charitable Causes Wayne Newton's life was a journey connected with heartfelt concerns and a deep desire to make a difference not just a symphony of songs and brilliant lights. Newton contributed his brilliant voice and wonderful heart to the 1996 performance of You Can't Say Love Enough. This all-star single wasn't just about music. It was a sincere project starring Dolly Parton, Heidi Newfield, and other artist celebrities. They worked together to raise critical money for diabetes research. This was more than simply a song. It was a work of love aimed at defeating a tenacious foe. Simultaneously, the American Diabetes Association established the Wayne Newton Research Grant. It became a beacon of hope, inspiring researchers such as Jose F. Caro and Peter J. Roach in their never-ending effort to defeat this terrible opponent. Wayne Newton took over as chairman of the United Service Organization's Celebrity Circle in 2001 after the legendary Bob Hope. This humanitarian organization was close to his heart because it provided live entertainment to members of the United States Armed Forces and their families. He carried on the legacy of entertaining and soothing the heroic individuals who defended the nation in this role. His love for the military was deep, and it was an honor he took great pride in. For decades, the Shenandoah Apple Blossom Festival in Winchester, Virginia has been a beloved event. In 2007, it celebrated its 80th anniversary, with none other than Wayne Newton leading the grand parade. He might have basked in the praise of a sold-out event, but instead, he opted to participate in the festival, embracing the spirit of the Shenandoah Valley. It was a touching gesture that endeared him to the public and demonstrated his commitment to the places and times that actually matter. Newton received the Woodrow Wilson Award for Public Service in 2008, an honor that echoed President Woodrow Wilson's values and concerns. The Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, a national tribute to the former president, recognizes community leaders. This award was a reflection of Wayne Newton's unwavering commitment to making a good impact on society. 
It was a tribute to a life lived not only on stage, but also in the hearts of people who had been touched by his compassion and benevolence. Wayne Newton's legacy extended beyond the music he made, the lights he controlled, and the stages he graced. Number two, the Wayne family. In recent years, Wayne Newton's personal life has been distinguished by a loving partnership with his current wife, Kathleen McCrone Newton, and the joys of family life. They've written a new chapter full of shared moments and enjoyment. Kathleen McCrone Newton, the woman who won Wayne Newton's heart, has been a source of comfort and affection in his life. Their relationship exemplifies eternal love, and it's clear that they've found consolation and strength in each other's company. Wayne's strong bond with Kathleen illustrates his tenacity in the face of adversity. Wayne Newton's life revolves around his family. He has a daughter, Erin Newton, and a son, Dakota Newton, who have both pursued various interests and carved out their own roots in life. Wayne's eldest daughter, Erin, has found her passion as an outstanding equestrian. Her passion for horses is similar to her father's, and she has built a name for herself in the world of competitive horseback riding. Her hard work and talent catapulted her to success, and she has become a proud representative of the Newton family history in the equestrian world. Dakota Newton, Wayne's son, has carved himself a career in music. He inherited his father's musical DNA and has made significant progress as a singer-songwriter. While living in the shadow of his iconic father may appear to be a tough task, Dakota has embraced his musical history and emerged as a remarkable performer in his own way, He's demonstrated a talent for writing and singing music that appeals to a new generation of listeners, and he's a living testimony to the Newton family's long musical tradition. The center of Wayne Newton's personal life now revolves around his treasured residence, Casa de Shenandoah. This spectacular ranch, located in Las Vegas, Nevada, is not only a home for him, but also a testimony to his lifelong passion for Arabian horses. It's a spot where his equestrian enthusiasm can be heard echoing through the verdant fields where majestic Arabian horses wander. It demonstrates his unwavering devotion to the Arabian breed, a love affair that has spanned centuries. Number 1. What's Next for Wayne? Even as the sun sets on Wayne Newton's illustrious career, his stage remains open and the performance goes on. The entertainer extraordinaire continues to captivate audiences in Las Vegas with the enduring power of his voice. It's an incredible monument to his ageless talent since he's appeared on stage over 50,000 times, captivating tens of millions of people. Newton's star shines brightly in a world where stars often fade, and he's not ready to extinguish those lights. The showman announced on August 2023 that he is extending his engagement at the Flamingo Las Vegas Hotel and Amp Casino through June 24. His unrelenting commitment to the stage demonstrates his genuine love for the craft. His 65th anniversary as a Vegas performer will be on May 2024, a bittersweet reminder of the remarkable adventure he's gone on. His enthusiasm for performance remains and his wit shines through when he says, I don't want to quit. I would have to get a real job. Wayne Newton is that ageless melody that refuses to fade into stillness in a world of retirement. We hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you in the next one.